So this is a collaboration track. I'm gonna get into that um, with, with French composer Julien Marshall. It's either I send like a musical idea to a collaborator or he just inspires me with something. It can be really raw. And I, I really like collaborating because obviously like we all make music based on inspiration and like inspiring each other is something that I thrive of. So Julien hit me up, I think on SoundCloud. Um, I wasn't familiar with his music, so I checked it out and it was really beautiful, like piano, close mic type stuff. And um, he seemed to be um, familiar with my stuff or like, as he said, was like a long time fan. So I was like, let's just do something because I really like what I'm hearing. And um, he sent me some piano improvisations, which one of these segments is lifted off. And that inspired me to write the whole track around. So I kind of sampled some original piano of his, um, which obviously like drives the character of the track, but also inspired all the other sounds to come around it. For me, like what inspired me almost more than the playing was like the sound of it. Because mm -hmm. it's, you know, like with piano, you can go for various types of recordings. It can be like this really marble, glassy, grand piano sound. So what I really reacted to with this one was the, it's kind of a close mic. You hear a lot of the pedal sounds. Yeah. It's like felt. Yeah, you hear the felt. The hammers. Up. So that, like the whole mechanics, you know. So I was really into that. And then I just really worked on like getting this sound out more, you know, like compressing it, EQing it. So it wouldn't be like too um, mid rangey in mm -hmm. a way, but mm -hmm. still sound warm, which was actually a challenge, you know, because a lot of warmth is in the midst. Yeah. But you don't want to clutter the, the, the song because there's a lot of other stuff going on. So, and, and then I was um, really interested in like, how much can I derive from that original sample without like playing stuff on top of it, okay. but like actually taking out of that recording. Okay. So like a lot of stuff, actually everything that is, including some of the pads I created, are lifted off of that. Or off like the created from that. the original melody. Yeah, yeah, like, okay. like with reverbs and like um, harmonic distortions on the original um, recording. What's interesting about this technique is that I work um, destructive, which means I delete a lot of stuff. So why do I do this? There's two reasons. One, it's CPU friendly, but that's not really a reason because your machines are so powerful nowadays. So you could have the luxury of like having a ton of plugins open and still not run into trouble. But the reason I do it is to limit myself and to limit myself to the endless possibilities that you have with music production, you know? I mean, I've, I find it distracting what I'm able to do technologically sometimes. And so what I do, almost like back in the day when people recorded on tape and they just needed that one take through that guitar amp. And um, if they didn't like that sound, they had to record it again. And it makes me commit to a sound, which I like. You know what I mean? It's like, I ask myself, do I like this? Is that the reverb I want on this? And if yes, I print it. Like th this whole idea of like being able to undo and like switch, try another preset, try this, try that. I don't want it. I just want to commit myself to the sound yep. and then work forward, which helps me to finish a track. Yeah. Otherwise I can always go back, which is not what I want. I feel you. For example, what I did, and I just pulled this up again to show you guys, that's why it's also on bypass. It's this diffuse, it's a Max for Life um, delay type thing, essentially. And I would just record a pass, and I'm just gonna demo this, of the piano running through the um, delay channel. I would just mess with it. might even just like do this. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was gonna demo that, that I sometimes catch that feedback loop as well and do stuff with that. But anyways, I didn't do that in this track. So here's a recorded version of what I just did. And as you can hear, it has like the Total flutter. shifting, the flutter, and I want all that. You know what I mean? So that's one example of like processing that I did on it. And that's why there's different spacious layers. It's not just like one piano loop just playing the whole time, although it's just this one section of his 
improvisation which I used, but there's so many variations of that, but sonically rather than like uh, tonally. Rather than, yeah. rather than uh, melodically almost. Exactly, yes. yeah, yeah. So which I is expanded a, that. Which is a great, it's a great trick basically to be able to, he's, he's real time recording himself with effects constantly and maybe you did that multiple multiple times oh yeah totally and then took all those different chunks and took the best ones and worked them in the right order that's for exactly to, yeah for right that for it to i mean i'm gonna play you some of these chunks which um which you just pointed out so that's derived of that original riff that we heard which clearly is not yeah what sounds, he played no it sounds nothing like it yeah but it's also it comes from that same thing and it's um again it's something i recorded running through um different plugins which i can't tell you again right sure. now because i deleted them but um <laughs> from like memory what i did here that was a granulizer you know the um mono lake one so i just zoomed in and had that on repeat Oop, yeah. and then obviously there's a lot of um ambience reverb sure Sure, thing sure. going on and then sometimes i would also just um accelerate certain harmonic distortions in the frequencies and just record those to layer them up i'm just going to run some of the other demos um or recordings i've made so this one for example same playing again with a sidechain compressor different basically just a low cut and a little bit of filter going on but this actual piece of audio you're seeing is already the re-recorded, treated one. Right. So it's like generation after generation, I will record this through stuff and then put it on another channel and run it through another chain again, possibly re-record that, get rid of what I did before. So I have like third, fifth, sixth generation of yeah. audio material generated from the original source. This is a great trick for a lot of people my students, all people, when you're starting out, you come up with a hot loop and you have like a really great loop to your track and everyone gets stuck. Like, how can I expand on this without completely changing, you know, the progression? But how can I make this seem like it e it's evolving over time, right? And this is a really great trick to do that. Right, also like your track in terms of dynamic, it wants to breathe, you know, if it's just, it was just gonna be that loop in the same dynamic for like four minutes, it right. would be really dull. But right, you right. can like, the way I constructed the track in the arrangement, it kind of like is a bit more like spacey and reverby and yeah. then it breaks down and becomes smaller and in more intimate. Well, because the frequencies are changing throughout. Exactly. As you, as you, you process from one clip to the other things are you know some of the highs are coming out some of the lows are being boosted and totally. vice versa throughout yeah. the song yeah so it's, that's essentially what's happening on that piano so here's um, a vocal group let's just listen to that on solo just little you know like fillers for ambience and the way I did these as you can see it's also recordings and I'm going to show you how I did that with the granulator. So I imported uh, a cappella of another song of mine. I like to always kind of sample myself. This is um, a recording I did for another song. As you can see, that's the whole a cappella lined up in the granulator. And then the granulator, um, Robert Henke, without going too deep, like designed it. He's like basically responsible for Ableton back in the day. Uh, Monolake um, is his artist moniker and he designed this um, Max for Life granulator which essentially is like a sampler which allows you to really zoom in all the way on the grains essentially of, of audio files. You can choose the length of the grain or like the, the length of the loop, how much you zoom in. So it's kind of like GRM tools freeze, you know, when you just um, zoom in onto one moment and it's just like giving you this hyper um, stuttery almost loop type thing. So I basically just improvised having the basic track run and that one on hot um, and then recorded stuff. Stop. 
Start. So I would basically just hit record, um, hold on, um, open another track, which is resample, and then just jam with that a little bit. And, you know, run that through next generations of and then go destructive out and things. And the best pieces out exactly, of Exactly, you know, then there will be this one moment, let's just say, I like this one, right. which is not true, but that would be it. Then I go on from there. I Do just further processing on it. Literally delete that and delete granulator. That has never happened. All I'm left with <laughs> is this piece. And then I work on from there. That's pretty much how this whole track, or like a lot of my tracks, exist or come into existence. Um, what's interesting about this, but that might be just me, when I find a moment I like, even like in a half an hour recording, I will take that moment and like disregard the rest. Yeah. I will not dig deeper, you know, totally. even though there might be gold at the end, but why? I have something that inspires me right now. So why waste my time and assess that whole recording or like the five hours worth of recording if need be, you know? So if there's this one moment that tickles your brain cells, it's like, there's a track right there. Forget the rest, start there. You know, that's the piece of advice I can give you because inspiration is like a fickle, magical thing, Absolutely. you know? And um, once you can grab it, might as well, you know, work with that. You're so right. You're so right. moving on, um, let's maybe listen to the um, drums and the bass, like the rhythm section of the track. So as you can see, there's like a little swing to it, uh, which I like, you know, especially if you work with um, like a straight bass drum, you know, I don't like it if it's like really dead quantized. So like makes it a little more alive. Also, it's like a slow BPM for like a four to the floor beat. It's 106, you know, so yeah, yeah. to make that not feel like really draggy, you have to kind of make it swing a bit. Can you I talk think. about how you achieve swing? Well, there's several ways how to do that. So, you know, Ableton offers you this function right here where you can load up grooves load up grooves yeah there's like all these um grooves from the mpc or like the sp whatever like all these yeah. drum machines mm -hmm. the way i did it on this one was get the groove from another source as you can see here's the um original recording from julien like the ideas two and three is what mm -hmm. he sent me mm -hmm. so i analyzed the groove of that because he had like a certain groove going on when he played that yeah yeah so as you can see, I use impulse, and um, then I just go through it, and I will um, do the thing. Here's my kick channel. I can just highlight this and then move the kicks up or down, uh -huh. depending on which one I like. I can assess it in the track. So the decay. As you can see, I also um, transposed it um, to match the tune of the song, you know, because that's another thing that can run you into uh, trouble when mixing the song. If your kick just has a tonality that doesn't match the track, absolutely, you can just EQ the hell out of it and you're like, why does it not come together? So <laughs> the way I do it, I assess it by just pitching it up an octave or more so I can actually hear. You know, it becomes more audible because the lower the frequency, it's like harder to tell. So here's another MIDI thing going on, which I played. Part of the groove. And you can see like, it's been a while since I worked on that song and my filter isn't even upgraded. So that's like an older version of Ableton that I made that in. Um, so essentially what's going on here is like, Pretty harsh, com no, not so harsh, um, pretty mild compression on the glue compressor. And then it's this thing from Contact, which is called Drum Lab, which is just one of many drum library type things. Multiple percussion sounds. Yeah, yeah. 
And you, um, what's nice about this, you can blend like an acoustic signal with an electronic one. So on a kick, would be like a Ludwig kick with their characteristics blended with 808 or something. Um, but I didn't even use it for anything bassy. This one is just percussive, as you can hear. But you know, it does its thing in the in the mix. Subtly, you know, but Absolutely. these are the things that just make a groove alive. Essentially, this is just the 808 sample with a few um, macros on it. So you can say, um, you know, kick skin sound, just fiddle with it a bit. But what's more interesting, there's a few compressors happening here. I have like some wave stuff happening, some Ableton stuff. Yeah, nothing crazy, you know, just compression and EQ. I've noticed that. This one isn't even on bypass. This is the first track we're seeing in your song that has anything, has more than Ableton plugins. Right. So why is that? Because I did not record that one. It's still first generation. It's the MIDI with the things. You know, if it was, if I would have treated the bass like I would have treated 80% of the sounds in this arrangement, the bass would just be an audio file called Recording 51. Um, it's typically more with like reverb type sounds or like really sound mangling sounds that really change the character of something that I want to dedicate to and not go back, you know, whereas here it's pretty clean. It's just an 808, some compression, nothing to, you know, write home about. Here's some cymbals going on. They have some swing to them. They recorded. Um, so a lot of stuff is recorded. Let me ask you this. Can we open your returns? Do you have any returns going? I do not. We can totally open them. This is interesting for me because, like, if this was one of my tracks, yeah, I would have all 12 returns used. You're telling me that this mix, as is, with this processing, which is mostly Ableton's effects, is what you sent to mastering? Pretty much, yeah. So here's the thing that needs to be said, though. The, the other reason why these are grouped is because I export groups and then I mix outboard. That's probably ah, what you're trying okay. to grasp okay. here. I'm not sure if you would all like be able to spot the master from my pre-master. The average listener, probably not, yeah. but the nerds, What's, yes. Yeah, the nerds would, and, and it's interesting in the transients. I can tell because of the symbol, yeah. like these more silky transients on the symbol, they really come out um, hitting the neve and hitting some of the compressors, whereas the Ableton um, thing would make it a little more dull but it's preference also. Some people would say, oh, I like that. You know, I like that it's not as bright sounding, which is also sure. very subjective. So sure. I think like the whole mastering and mixing discussion is highly subjective, you know, because it's like, what do you like? Like Absolutely. how bright, how li loud do you like a sound even to be, you know? Would you say that you like the, the low end on it better running through the board or just through Ableton? Um, on this one, I like some of the sparkliness, some of the air that was added, but it's literally like for me, it's like 10 or 20% max. Okay. So I wouldn't even be depressed if that mix would be on the record without having done all that. There's other songs on that record where I'm like so glad we did that, you know? Yeah. But with this particular one, I think the, you know, the advancements we had, or the, the betterment, so to say, were very, you know, Subtle. small steps, Subtle, which, yeah. which are important, you know, I'm all about details, yeah, but yeah. again, like, um, it's, it's from track to track. You can't so generalize. Can I ask you, what are some of your favorite reverbs? One I recently discovered is the adaptive verb. So there's an artificial intelligence here that tracks the tune and the tone of the original material mm -hmm. and creates harmonic filtering, which is reverbs based on the actual harmonics in the signal as opposed to reverbs, uh, sorry, like um, harmonics that aren't in the signal. And that helps tremendously with mixing because if a reverb creates harmonics that are like off key with your original signal, right, clashing with your original, you're going to clutter your mix. Song, yeah. yeah, you're going to clutter the mix similar with like the tune of a kick or whatever. Sure. And that applies with reverbs too. So if you have like a reverb like this one that artificially intelligently um, analyzes the source and like, you know, gives you harmonic filtering that is in tune. That's pretty dope. Mm. 
That's thank a good you, one. Though. Thank you so much. Dude, thanks, really man. I really appreciate it. Round of applause for Robert Koch.